This video is a look at using TCP Dump for capturing and analyzing packets on network interfaces. It will look at how to use TCP Dump by example on a demo virtual machine. The topics covered will include starting captures, understanding the capture display output, saving captures to a file, reading from existing capture files, using filter expressions to isolate traffic for capture or for display, and changing display options. For more information on TCP Dump, please go to www.tcpdump.org or review the TCP Dump man page. Before we jump in, a quick definition. TCP Dump is a utility used to capture and analyze packets on network interfaces. Details about these packets can either be displayed to the screen or they can be saved to a file for later analysis. TCP Dump utilizes the libpcap library for packet capturing. When troubleshooting or investigating network conditions, TCP Dump is like taking the cover off the network to look inside and see what is really going on. So let's jump right in and start using it. Version checking. Assuming TCP Dump is installed, version information can be obtained with TCP Dump -h. On this system, we can see the TCP Dump version is 4.4.0 and the libpcap version is 1.4.0. In this video, all examples are on an Ubuntu VM I have running in VirtualBox. Running TCP Dump. The first thing to note is TCP Dump requires super user privileges. Therefore, in this video, all commands are prefaced with the sudo keyword. To run TCP Dump, the available interfaces for packet captures needs to be determined. If these are not already known, they can be checked with TCP Dump -d. On this VM, eth0, eth1, any, and the loopback interfaces are available. The any option is a sudo interface that can display packets from all interfaces. Let's capture packets on all interfaces by using the any option. Now we see packets are moving by way too fast to read. TCP dump will not stop without an interrupt signal, so to stop the capture I'll use control plus C. Instead of letting TCP dump run until interrupted, you can use the lowercase c option. This option instructs the utility to stop after the specified number of packets are captured. In the output we can see host names are being used instead of IP addresses. Also, commonly known ports are replaced with application names. Usually, however, it is easier to work with IP addresses and port numbers instead of these names. The lowercase n option will take care of this. Now the output shows IP addresses and port numbers. When TCP dump is run without the dash n option, the utility will trigger reverse or PTR DNS lookups to find host names for IP addresses as it captures them. This is good to keep in mind to realize TCP dump is itself triggering DNS traffic as it captures if the dash n option is not used. Capture packet size. On the second line we can see it says the capture size is 65,535 bytes. This means that for every packet TCP dump will keep 65,000 bytes for analysis. This is much larger than the typical packet size so essentially this is saying TCP dump is capturing full packets. It's important to note the default capture size. Some versions of TCP dump default to much smaller capture sizes, for example 96 bytes. This would mean just the first 96 bytes of every packet is captured and the rest is thrown away. The capture size can be altered with the lowercase s option. Here you can see I've requested just 96 bytes for each packet instead of the default I had of 65,000. Specifying zero with the dash s option means maximum size or 65,000 as was seen in the default. When performing captures, it's important to think about the goal when deciding the packet size to set. For example, if you're just looking for evidence of lost or out of order packets on a large file transfer, you probably don't need much more than 64 or 96 bytes of each packet. Alternatively, if you're troubleshooting problems at the application layer, you may require having full packets with nothing thrown out. In that case, the max size of 65,000 should be plenty. TCP dump output. Here's a look at the fields displayed in the TCP dump output for some TCP packets. First, there is a timestamp for when libpcap picked up the packet. On this VM, we can see values down to milliseconds and even to microseconds. Next, the protocol is specified. After this is the source IP of the packet, a dot, and then the source port of the packet. After the source IP and port is the destination IP and port. These addresses are followed by TCP flags, which could be SYN, ACK, RESET, FIN, URGENT, and PUSH. All the flags are represented by their first letter, with the exception of ACK, which is represented by simply a dot. For an example, I'll generate some traffic over my ETH1 interface to another VM. 
first to a closed port on the other VM and then to an open port. When connecting to the closed port we can see a SYN packet from my VM and immediately we see a reset from the other VM. Then when connecting to port 22 through SSH which is open we see the normal three-way handshake. First the SYN and then the SYN ACK in return and finally the ACK. The next fields are the sequence and acknowledgement numbers. TCP dump by default uses relative numbers here. Let's look at an example. For now you can ignore the filter expression I used because I'll cover that later. This capture is just looking at one direction of traffic on one TCP session. In the first captured packet, the real sequence numbers are displayed. These long numbers here. Sequence numbers are 32 bits long. After that first packet, TCP dump switches over to showing relative sequence numbers because they are easier to track. So here in the second packet we see we have a sequence number of 196 and it goes up through sequence number 359. The last number on the right here, 360, is actually the first expected byte number on the next packet. So here we have bytes 196 to 359, then on the next one we have 360 to 491, and on the next packet 492 to 623. And if you follow this down you'll see these sequence numbers increasing as we would expect. After the sequence numbers we have acknowledgement numbers, which again TCP dump changes to relative numbers. So as an example in this capture, we can see that we have here in the middle sequence number 1308 through 1535, then 1536 through 1683, we have all those bytes pass through, and then the receiving host sends back an acknowledgement 1684 saying it expects to see sequence number or byte number 1684 next. And after this we do see the sending host sends packet number 1684 up through 1831, and then 1832 up to 1963, and again we're seeing acknowledgement for 1964, the next expected sequence number. Incidentally, relative sequence numbers can be turned off with the uppercase S option. After the sequence and acknowledgement numbers is the receive window size. Here we can see a window size of 333. However, this is actually not the real receive window because window scaling is enabled. To be able to see that window scaling is enabled, you need to go back to the three-way handshake. This is where the window scaling option would be noted and where the scaling factor is defined. Here in the SYN packet from IP 74.125.224.46, a scaling factor of 7 is seen. This actually means to multiply the receive window by 2 to the power of 7. So down here, we're looking at the receive window size of 333, you actually need to multiply this by 2 to the power of 7, which is 128. This means the real receive window is 128 times 333, which comes out to over 42,000 bytes for a receive window. Finally, there is the packet length. This shows how many bytes are present inside the layer 4 headers. For example, here a length of 108 is seen. This matches up with the sequence numbers discussed a moment ago. On this packet, we can see it says 1 to 109. If you subtract 109 from 1, you get the length of 108. On this packet is 1 to 577. Again, subtracting 577 minus 1 gives the length of 576. Let's look at sample output for DNS requests. Here is a capture on port 53. DNS, of course, uses UDP port 53. Now I'll do a wget to youtube.com to generate some DNS traffic. In the capture display, we can see the demo VM made two requests back to back. First, an A record query, which is an IPv4 query for YouTube.com. After that is a quad A query for YouTube.com, so this is for IPv6. Next, there are the responses. For the A query, there are 11 IPs returned back from my DNS server. For quad A for IPv6, one record came back in response. After this is some interesting activity. It looks like there is an HTTP redirect to www.youtube.com. So my VM queried DNS for that FQDN on IPv4 and IPv6. The responses for www.youtube.com use names or aliases in their reply. Saving captures to a file. Often TCP dump is used to save captures to a file for later analysis. This is done using the lowercase w option. Now the capture is being written to the file capture.pcap. An issue here is there is no indication of how many packets are being written, or if any at all are being captured. 
So when writing packets to a file, the lowercase v option is very helpful. Now we can see the number of packets captured. Again, TCB dump will continue to run until interrupted. When writing to a file and capturing on high traffic interfaces, the file can grow quite large very fast. This can pose a problem on a system which lacks sufficient storage space. A good way to limit the file size is to use the lowercase c option. Here this capture will write to the file capture.pcap, but it will stop after 20 packets. Reading capture files. Existing capture files can be read with the dash r option. The same output is seen as when packets were displayed straight to the screen. Again, packets go by too quickly on large files, so I'll use a pipe and less, and that'll help me so I can scroll up and down through the capture. TCP dump filter expressions. The use of filters is important when using TCP dump, especially when working with very large capture files. Filters let you lock in on just the types of traffic you are interested in and ignore the rest. So let's see some examples. Host keyword. With this capture, I'm using the host keyword to specify that I only want to capture traffic going to or from the IP at 10.0.0.3. If I now ping that VM, in the capture window, immediately the ICMP packets are seen. All of the traffic not relating to 10.0.0.3 is being ignored for analysis. The source and destination keywords. This is the same capture as before, except I've now added the source keyword, SRC. Destination would have been DST. Now only one direction of traffic is seen, packets sourced from 10.0.0.3. The return traffic to 10.0.0.3 in this case is being skipped. Filter expressions support the use of the logical operators AND and OR. In this capture, we only get packets between the two hosts 10.0.0.1 and 10.0.0.3. We won't see any other traffic for those two IP addresses, only traffic between those two IPs. Filters can be used to isolate traffic to define TCP or UDP ports. Here, only port 80 traffic is captured. I'll do a wget to google.com, and in the capture window, the HTTP traffic only on port 80 is seen. Here is an example of a compound expression. Port 80 or port 443 traffic is shown, but only for the address 192.168.1.91 as the source or destination. Note the parentheses around the port numbers. These are important to include both ports as part of the AND statement here. If they were not used, I would not get the intended result. Also note when using compound expressions, the use of quotes around the entire expression. This is required due to the use of parentheses. Otherwise, the parentheses will be interpreted as special bash characters and the capture will not work. More filters. Filters can be used to include or ignore an entire subnet. Here is a filter I use to look for traffic heading towards public internet IPs. The source of this traffic should be from the network 192.168.0.0 with the slash 16 subnet mask. I'm using the net keyword to accomplish this. Also, the destination networks should not be local. They should not be in the 192.168.0.0/16 or the 10.0.0.0/8 subnets. Filters can be applied based on MAC addresses as well using the ether host keyword. This capture is restricted to traffic to or from this MAC address. In the capture output, MAC addresses aren't visible by default. So to see MAC addresses in captures, we use the lowercase e option. Note when capturing on the any interface, you may not see full MAC information. 
Some more filters include protocol type. These can include the TCP, UDP, ICMP, ARP, and RARP keywords. IPv6 traffic can be viewed with the IP6 keyword. I'll do a ping to an IPv6 IP, and in the capture window that ICMP traffic shows up. Finally, here are some filters based on TCP flags. This capture will only show packets with the SYN flag set. Similarly, here is an example to look only for TCP resets. Adjusting TCP Dump's output. TCP Dump has some options to adjust the output seen when looking at capture data. The dash XX option displays more detail about packets, specifically in hex format as well as ASCII format. Here we can see the HTTP GET as ASCII. Often the hex is actually not needed, so the dash A option can be used instead. I'll do another wget, and here is some ASCII HTTP data. The dash V option is used to provide more detail or verbosity in packet captures. Dash VV and dash VVV will provide increasing levels of detail respectively. When displaying more verbosity on my VM, TCP dump displays an error indicating there is a checksum error. This message is usually because the system has checksum offloading enabled, and at the point at which libpcap grabs packets, the correct checksum hasn't yet been inserted. This error can be ignored by using the uppercase K option. Somewhat opposite to the dash V options is the dash Q option, which provides minimal quiet display output. One last option I'll look at here is the timestamp display option, which uses lowercase t. Depending on how many t's are used, this changes the display. For example, one t removes timestamps completely. Three t shows the time difference between consecutive packets in the output. This one is useful to look for spikes or slowdowns on particular packet types. 5T shows the time since the first packet in the capture, which is useful when measuring how long certain transactions take to complete. That wraps up this look at TCP dump. I hope you found it useful. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to this channel. Special thanks to those who have subscribed and commented on my videos. It's great to hear back from the community. As usual, if you'd like to contact me directly, you can do so through www.linkedin.com slash IN slash David Mahler.